like to bring you a word the Lord has laid on my heart as we consider the concept and the it is a concept based on a sweeping story from the Old Testament regarding the exodus of God's people let's read a verse and then you can get settled in so let's stand together numbers 27 16 let the Lord the God of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation. This is Moses. He's about to die. And he's worried about, he's concerned about succession. Because success without a successor is a failure. He wants there to be someone who can take his place. And here's his prayer request. Let the God of the spirits of all flesh set a man over the congregation and this is Moses vision Moses deepest hearts desire for the future of the people of God he said here's my laundry list this is my punch list for this guy who's gonna lead in my place who may go out before them and go in before them. Notice how symmetrical this is. Who may go out before them and go in before them. Who may lead them out and bring them in. Not lead them out and leave them out. And I'm going to tell you, God's desire for His people has not changed from Moses' vision. God wants to lead us out with a reason and a purpose. That is not to leave us out, but to lead us somewhere better. Who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. So, you cannot go in unless you come out. Can't go in unless you come out. It's a matter of basic spatial understanding. There's no way you can come into the sanctuary physically and in your body without getting out of the outdoors. It's impossible. Oh, you're like, I could watch online. No, I said bodily, right? Aren't you glad you're here bodily? You came out of your home, you came into your car, you got out of your car, you came into church, we're here today, and we want the Lord to help us to be mindful of what He has, not in store just for Pastor Haman or the leadership of the church, but in, in mind for you, regardless of where you come from, regardless of how you feel about yourself, and regardless of your past, everyone here, God knows your social security number. And he knows even more than that, he knows the hairs of your head. And he even knows more than that, he knows your past, he knows the redeeming factor that's needed to cover your past, to completely forgive your past, to leave your past where it belongs and in the past. He knows how to bring you into a place that you never dreamed. And at that place is where we're going in the house of the Lord. One more scripture while you're standing, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 the end of a thing is better than its beginning that's philosophical isn't it the end of a thing is better than its beginning the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit Lord Jesus have your way in this time Lord we as a congregation we have gathered to really intentionally carve out of our lives this moment where we're here for a focus upon the things of God. Lord, as we truly are here because of our own heart's desire, we want you, Lord Jesus, to really help us in that focus. And Lord, would you help the preacher, the teacher, the speaker to do a good job, to explain it well, so there's no gray area and it's not ambiguous, but it is so perfectly clear that you 
have a better tomorrow for every one of us. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You are welcome to take your seats. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. The title of this part of my series is The End is the Beginning. Would you please repeat after me? The end is the beginning. I can't hear you, mostly ladies. Guys, would men, men, would you say it? The end is the beginning. Good, God, good, good job. How about ladies, by yourselves? The end uh, is the what? Thank you. The end is the beginning. What does that mean? What does that mean? The end is the beginning. I love walking in to a brand new adventure, whether it's a mall, shopping center, or it's a state park or a national park, or you just name it for yourself. Place I've never been before. West Edmonton Mall is an example. What an incredible mall. I mean, that thing is like 17 blocks long. And it is all under one roof, and it's got incredible features in Canada. And you can go in, what is it, probably 45 to 50 main entrances around the mall, and every entrance you go in, you could be completely lost. But what you're looking for is a directory to help you know that little star, you are here. And then you can breathe a sigh of relief, put your, put your uh, antidepressants away, and get excited about an adventure because you know where you are. What's difficult is to be in a place that you've never been before and not know where you are. Today, this goes for every one of us. We're in a place we've never been before. But you've come to a place today with a man of God who's on the platform today who doesn't want to preach right now, but I want the Lord to preach. I want the Lord to speak. And here's what the Lord has impressed upon me. He wants to help you know exactly where you are so that you can make decisions accordingly and go where he wants you to go that is the best for your and your best interest. I'm going to tell you, that's the God we serve. He, he wants you to go where you've never been before and you have to have the kind of faith that settles in and says, okay, where am I? Where am I? In order to find out where we are, it's very important to have a perspective of history. In fact, that scripture, the end of a thing is better than the beginning, that's about perspective. Because it's way better to have the end. You're at the end now but you have a perspective you didn't have at the beginning, right? You can look back over your path and see the things you did right, see the things you did wrong, see the things you'll never do again, and see the things you hope will happen again. That's why we say, and that's why the Scripture says, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. You know what that puts in my spirit? A hope for adventure, because this has got to be a new beginning for every one of us because we are in the middle of a time that is confusing it's a time that is that is so filled with trepidation and uncertainty but we have something rock solid that is god's word and we also have the hope that this right here is the ending of something so god can begin something better come on somebody say better ah so it's Okay that it's the end, Pastor. Yes, it is. The end is the beginning. An intriguing observation about the flow of history. It has been suggested by a historian by the name of Christopher Dawson that there have been six identifiable ages in relation to the Christian church, starting with the first century, starting with the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Spirit. There have been six ages now listen closely. These ages last three or four hundred centuries. And all ages, every one of them, has a similar course that they follow. So if you've got a pattern for something that's happened in the past, you can put yourself in the present in the pattern and know what... It's kind of like hopscotch. No, hopscotch is the wrong sport. That's a sport, right? 
Now, it's kind of like jump rope. The rope went around and hit your feet. That was the wrong time to jump. I don't know why this just came to my mind, but it did. You got to know the timing, right? I wish I had a jump rope so I could show you how bad I am at jump rope. But, but you go around and you, and you can anticipate, and based on the rhythm of the rope flying over your head, you know when to jump, and of course you know most of the time when not to jump. There is a precise moment in time when you do that little hop and the rope goes under. And when that happens, you're like, if you're like me, you're like, woo! <laughs> I got one. <laughs> I don't know about two. Don't keep watching. It's going to be embarrassing. The rope will probably hit my feet again. But if you can kind of see the roll of history, it's sort of like that rope going over your head. You can think, okay, I wasn't there 150 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. But you know there are patterns that are being followed and if I can jump in the right time and see where I am right now I know exactly how to respond to this moment in time so this historian has identified that each age all of those six ages begin and end like a like a cycle they end and they begin in crisis crisis what is crisis? How many of you love? How many of you woke up this morning saying, God, send more crisis? We don't need a crisis. Crises. Every age begins and ends with crisis. And watch this. In the middle, when you're on your way back up through the cycle, there is achievement and decay and crisis. And then it's time for the next age. Achievement and decay and crisis. Achievement and decay and crisis. That's happened six times since the first century. You know where I believe we are right now? I believe we're in beginning and ending. I believe we're in crisis. And do you think that makes me sad and scared? No. Because I'm looking forward to the next age the next age come on you know maybe maybe some of us need to take uh, maybe we need to pass out some boost oxygen bottles to just kind of maybe the, those 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 face masks have kind of got you a little down your, your blood oxygen's down a little bit man I mean if you're like me this this one right here is like breathing in a pillow I'm like ah, get a breath praise the Lord but everybody's safe around me Hey, hey, listen, I want y'all to just tune in for a second, okay? If the ages four and five and now six has passed and we're right now in the middle of a crisis, what's the next one going to hold? I don't know, but I do know that if God is a God of patterns and a pattern of God of cycles, I'll probably be able to see it in the past so I can see it in the present. If I can see it as something that has happened in the Bible then it makes me think, okay, maybe it'll happen, and maybe it really is true that it's happening today in our world. So I'm ready for you. If that's your question, I'm ready for you. Where are we now? I believe society, and I even believe that Calvary, apostolic church, is presently, along with society around us, we're at such an ending and beginning. The crisis is upon us. The enemy is real. And so is the need for those with spiritual drive and determination to stand up and meet the challenge and say, if this is a time of crisis, then bring it on because there's a better day coming. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to say it's too much. No, I'm just going to say, bring on another age. If there's another age, then bring it on. I'm ready for what God has in store for me. I contend that there, is, there have got to be a group of people who say, not going to be too hard. How many of you have kind of noticed life is like this? It's cyclical. You go through good times, and then suddenly you go through hard times. Good, and then not so good. Crisis brings about the rotation and the revolution. Speaking of revolution, one of our American founding fathers, by the name of Thomas Paine, he wrote a series of tracts called The Crisis Papers during the Revolutionary War. Crisis papers. These papers were so stirring to George Washington that he ordered them read to his troops in December of 1776. See, 
In December of 1776, it looked like the American cause was going down hard in flames. It looked like it was not going to work out. There was not going to be hope, and there would never be an American vision. It looked like it was going to be a lost cause. But you know what? George Washington, he had something inside of his bosom, a fire burning, that told him, I think what some of us are feeling right now, that there is a better day if we'll just hang on. If we'll just be strong, if we'll just stick to what we know. And, and, and listen, when he read the crisis papers, it fired him up even more. And he said, I want those papers read to my troops right now in the middle of the worst part of our crisis. Do you mind if I read a line? These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. Woo. It's awesome to me that Thomas Paine also understood what would happen if men and women did not shrink from a life so spent. He wrote, but he that stands now, everybody say, stands now. Everybody who stands now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Here's what happened. Those words were so decisive, so powerful, and so passionate that when Washington, George Washington troops heard those words, many of the soldiers who were going to be rolling out of their enlistment in January, they said, re-enlist me. I want to get back in the fight. I want to do something for my country. I don't want to be someone who does not stand. I want to be someone who stands in a time of crisis. And sure enough, if you know the history, they went on to win Trenton. The tide of the war was turned, and we have America today to be thankful we as America have to be thankful for those who had fire in their bosom fire in their belly they understood that there was a course of action that had to be taken history has cycles now watch this biblically Adam and Eve enjoyed communion with God right achievement and then what happened the tempter came and invaded crisis they disobeyed God and it brought sin and death upon themselves and the world so there's an ending but a beginning right watch this adam's great 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 grandson four greats enoch walked so closely with god that god took him there was a time when there was definitely some powerful influence for the things of god after adam and eve came out of the garden of eden and god spared enoch from death we just went over that in one of our recent bible studies at home didn't we brother david enoch was spared death never had to die because he was in that cycle, and he, he had, at the top of the cycle, he went up to heaven. Now, how many of you want to do that? Before going back down, he didn't have to live to see the world plunge. And his great-grandson, Noah, was living in a generation that was in such a crisis. See, that cycle came around again, and the wickedness of man was great, the Lord said. So great, he said, the intent of every one of his thoughts is only evil continually. And the Lord said, I am sorry that I made humanity. He said, I'm going to destroy humans. You talk about a crisis now. But hold the, hold the phone. Noah, in the middle of a crisis, finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah pleased God. Noah caught God's attention, and God said, okay, all right. I'm not going to destroy all of humanity. I'm willing to give humanity another chance through a brand new progenitor, a brand new father named Abraham. Noah pleased God. And so we have another cycle that begins. God saved humanity by way of a great big boat, the ark. God blessed Noah and his sons. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they did so. However, out of that scenario comes another cycle where we have God coming to earth and knocking the worldwide effort for secularization back on its heels at the Tower of Babel. It, was that even a place for the word secularization, Pastor Heyman? <sighs> yes. Secular comes from a Latin word which means this present age. Secular is descriptive of that which is divorced from religious or spiritual sensibility, enthroning that which is of this world. Putting it on a pedestal and saying what this world 
has in it is more important than spirituality or God. And that's what happened at the Tower of Babel. And God came down and he confused the languages, scattered the populations as, as he had required earlier to Noah and his sons. He had to kind of do it on his own. And they scattered and there we have the beginning of languages and populations throughout the known earth at that time. And then about ten generations later, Abram is born. And he's given a promise. Oh, hallelujah. God says, it's time to choose a bloodline for Messiah. It's time to choose a bloodline for the anointed one. Who will be the man through whom I can see families go through generations? And that family, all tracing back to that individual, will actually have the Christmas story. Jesus in a manger born to redeem all of humanity. Oh, Abraham. Good idea. Abraham. He chose Abraham. That was the choice. Ten generations after Enoch, after the Tower of Babel. Ten generations. Abram is born, given a promise. Here's, here's Abram's promise. God says, Abram, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Oh boy, everybody see in this cycle? He's going up now. He became the father of the faithful, founding father of Judaism. God changed his name to Abraham and promised him the land that was to belong to his descendants, future Israel. And Abram, like you and us, you and I, we, we, I already asked you and you said yes. Okay, that's us. Everybody who's at church, say, that's me. Take a deep breath through your mask and say, that's me. Listen to this. Abram had his own life cycles to survive. Many of them, achievement and decay. Faith and testing and failing once in a while, but coming back. And one of the biggest and most notorious cycles in the life of Abraham was the divine destruction of the depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah in the lifetime of Abraham. Because there was the rise of godlessness in that region. And then God said, it's going to not last. I'm going to end this thing. And he brought on hail, fire from heaven, and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a crisis. And that crisis Abraham lived through. And then, we don't have to say, oh no. See, see how, okay. <clears throat> how many of you have already heard a time or two in what I've just said that it would be a good time to give up? You, you don't understand yet? Okay, then stick with me. Watch. Watch this. All right, come on. I'm going to just, just get you with me one way or another, all right? Abraham, Abraham has a great grandson by the name of Joseph, all right? Now, Joseph is a man who is in the middle of a famine, but he doesn't even know it because he's so aware of God's timing. And, and Joseph, the, grand, the great grandson of Abraham, became the saving factor for the descendants of Abraham when Abraham's descendants didn't have enough food to eat, they, they didn't have enough, enough nourishment to stay alive. They, they're in a famine. They're in a crisis. Come on, somebody. They're at the bottom of the curve. They don't know what to do. They hear there is food in Egypt. And sure enough, the crisis comes to a point where they leave their, their home country and they move into Egypt. And that move into Egypt numbered about 70 of Joseph's family. They all transferred for safety and for survival. And it was not long until right there in Egypt, they were the superpower. Now, are y'all seeing a little, is it interesting that God is a cyclical God? I'm so glad he's not this mean, ugly, cruel, dictator kind of a grandfather in the sky with a thunderbolt in his hand who's saying, good luck trying to figure me out. No, he's the kind of God who says, read your Bible. I want to show you that I love you and I care for you. And where you are right now is no exception. It doesn't matter if you're in crisis. There's something better that I have in store for you. If you'll just hang on for the ride, the best is yet to come. I am not finished with you yet. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Raise your hand and say, thank you, Jesus, for the cycles we see clearly. Achievement, decay, crisis. Children of Israel were fruitful and increased, according to Exodus 1-7. They increased abundantly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. 
That's what it says. And the land was filled with them. See, they went in as a little group of 70, scared, fearful, hungry. Their ribs were showing. We need food. We heard there's food here. 70 years later, I mean, 70 of them come in. But it's only a few years later, and they have kids by the scads. They're reproducing everywhere. The whole the 70 suddenly turns into the overwhelming power in the land. There's, there's what, what I would say the rise of something very amazing happening. There was a time when no doubt they're like, woo, generation or two lived right in the middle of that. They're like, wow, we came in as the needy, but look at us. We're the ones who are the mighty now. We have no fear any longer. Look at us. We have so many numbers. We don't have to be afraid of anyone around us. But here's what the next, the next, uh, next chapter, next verse says. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, <clears throat> Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. The devil's looking at you right now, and he's saying, I hope you don't hear that message. Because you are more and mightier than the devil is. Now that's a little advanced sidebar, okay? <laughs> we are more and mightier. Pharaoh, speak it again. Okay. Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. And then we will lose our stronghold as a world power. Therefore, well, look what the Egyptians did. Now, I, I want you all to just put yourselves in the shoes, sandals, maybe bare feet, maybe rags wrapped around their feet, I don't know. But put yourselves in the lives of those who were the descendants of Joseph, who had a moment in time when it seemed like things were really going well. They were swelling in their numbers, growing by leaps and bounds. Suddenly, here are the headlines. Are you ready for the headlines? Here they are. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. They stopped being friendly and started being enemies. They built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were afflicted, watch this now. Anybody see a crisis here? Yeah, there's a crisis. But there's some people of God who somehow are by God's power being transformed and being helped. I, I don't think it was because that they just decided to get themselves strong and, and to really be a good group, group of people. No, it's because God said, I have a plan for that group of people. And I'm going to come down myself and be a part of their growth and their multiplication. And nothing can stop it. I don't care about a crisis. I don't care about taskmasters. I don't care about a whip over their back. I'm going to be there and I'm going to make a difference in the middle of the crisis. And look what happened. The more they afflicted them, somebody read it with me. Come on, read it with me. Get in this message with me. Would you just kind of get in step verse 12? But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. Woo! Anybody see the crisis? There's an ending, but there's a beginning. Hang on for the ride. There's something better coming. Aren't y'all glad for this Exodus series? Y'all follow where I'm at now? I believe we are in such a place coming out of this pandemic, coming out of this COVID-19 situation and all of the protests around us and the rioting and the confusion and the uprising and the tyranny. What, what, is, what is our world coming to? Our, our world's on fire. It's nothing new to God. This is what needs to keep us on our knees and keep us with our Bibles open and keep us close to Jesus and keep us focused in on him and saying, God, you are not finished with humanity and you're not finished with me. You have a better plan. You're working and you know what's best. Amen. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. Rigor means that they made it so that they were trying to break them down. They were trying to make them weak as water. 
they made it so that they would try to, they wanted them to give up. The, the devil is real. And he wants you to give up. He wants me to give up. You know, folks, these church services coming out of pandemic or in the middle of it, if you want to call it that, which it does seem like we're still in the middle of it with the, nation, the, the states around us having spikes. What, what does it make us do? It makes us, as a people, stop and ask. I mean, I, I, it doesn't make me just want to plunder forward blindly. It makes me want to say, God, get on my knees and say, God, where are we now? And Lord, what do you want out of me now? And what does this mean for me now? I am not satisfied to just be mindless conformist of the things that I've been told before. I want to get it for myself. And I want to understand that you are really personally involved. And I'm not satisfied to be someone who's just hoping I get it right. But God, I've only got one shot at this and I want to get it right. So Lord, give me a perspective of where you're headed and what you're doing and what you want out of me. Open my eyes that I may want, that I may be, be able to see wonderful things from your law. God, I got to have it. They made the Egyptians, the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter. They gave them hard bondage. They made them in mortar and brick and all manner of service work until they were, they were weary to the bone. They made them miserable. They made them so sick and tired of being sick and tired that they decided there's just got to be more than this. We, 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 we we're now not in the same place we were before. This, this seemed like it was all candy and roses before, but now we're having a hard time. You know, before it would have been really hard to let God come in here and pull us out because things were going pretty good. We were growing and we were, we, we had power. We were part of the superpower, but you know what? That's changing. Something's happening and now it's not so good and it's now we're not so happy anymore. As a matter of fact, the crack of day, I have a taskmaster standing at my door and he is telling me, get up and get out to the pit and start stomping down the, the, the pit uh, the pitch and the mortar and start getting yourself busy and work to the end of the day and work until you can't work anymore. Oh, I don't know if I want to put up with this anymore. Can I tell you God's people were a really good example in Egypt of how we are to respond. I want you to notice that they did not have one riot. But I'm going to give you permission right now to protest. If protesting leads to breaking laws, hurting people, and tearing up your city, it's not godly. But I got a protest in mind for you, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Again, it says, all their service in which they made them serve was with, is that rigor or rigor? How many rigors? Raise your hand. Any rigors? Raise your hand. The reason I'm confused is because I heard a doctor call it rigor one time. I'm like, oh, well, I didn't look it up. Okay, we're at a transition time. The service is almost over, and it's almost your turn to grab this and run with it. But let me say these last words. The people of God thrived so much that they threatened Pharaoh's economic and political power. That realization made Pharaoh wake up and became their enemy by putting them to grueling work, making every effort to break them down, make giving making every effort to get them to give up, to make them say, I can't do this anymore. The harshness of slave labor grew progressively worse until, everybody say until. <laughs> they realized our security is transformed into slavery. Oh, the light bulb went on and they realized their safety was now misery. They realized the life they were living was going in the wrong direction. And they realized that Egypt was really not a place they could call home any longer. They received a revelation by way of the 
pressure they were under. Listen now, they received a revelation by the pressure they were under. Wow, I have got to see change. I can't live this way anymore. I gotta tell you, brothers and sisters, that this is where we all have got to come in our relationship to the world around us. If you are happy, satisfied, all your bills are paid and everybody's good in your life and you have a perfectly calm family and home and future and everything is great and you have no reason, I'm kind of surprised you're even here if that's the case. But you know what? If you really are in that kind of a real world situation, then I want you to join me and start thinking about this. God does not put us through crisis without a purpose he does not put us through issues and pressure without a purpose can i tell you god god didn't stop it with the hardship i mean they, they were hard hard labor there was a generation that came and that died through this hard labor maybe two generations lived and died maybe three lived and died through this but it got worse and it got worse. And God allowed another 80 years of this mess, this difficulty, this tragedy, this, this pressure to escalate. But not without the birth of a man named Drawn Out. I'm going to give this guy a name that's going to resonate with his purpose and resonate with his mission. Moses means Drawn Out. Now watch this. Moses is now 80 years old. He's in the wilderness. He suddenly is in a position to hear from God. And here's the history. Exodus 2.23. It happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel, watch this. Everybody read it with me. Do you have it on the screen? What did the children of Israel do? Did they have a party? No. Did they riot downtown? Did they destroy property of all the Egyptians? Did they have a big protest Out, outdoors and, you know, taunting the Egyptian police? No, no, no. They did something that you're, you're giving permission, you're given permission to do today. What did they do? Children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. Groan. Can, can I just, on three, get you to, let me hear what a groan sounds like. Ready? One, two, three. That didn't sound like you're in Egypt. I wonder what it really sounded like in Egypt. Look what it next says after that. They groaned loud enough. They groaned earnestly enough. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. His covenant with them, with them was that everything's going to be all right and I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. God looked upon the children of Israel and God, the Bible says, God acknowledged them. <laughs> How many of you could use a little God acknowledgement today? How many of y'all are good? No need for God acknowledgement. We're good. How many of you are like, okay, that's why I came. I need God to say something. I need God to notice. Okay, God, I'm ready. Would you, would you show up? I need you to pay attention. Okay, God, where are you? I need you to acknowledge. Well, the formula was not going to a Bible school and getting a long diploma list of, 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 of uh, credentials behind your name. and the, It, it didn't, take a, didn't take study and years of, of difficulty and tests and lessons. No, all it took was groaning. The Lord said in verse 7 of chapter 3, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have what? Woo! I have heard their cry. See, this message right now is for people who pray too quietly. For people who pray too passively. And people who've grown up learning that prayer is just about shutting your mouth and your eyes and just being quiet. Because listen, I know there's a time for that, yes. And I know there's a time I do that, yes. But you know what, there's a time when it's way past time to start making some noise. 
There's a time when it's way past time to start saying, now, now, now I see where I am. Pastor, you help me see where we're at. We're in a crisis. We're in a difficult time. We're in a time where our nation is in upheaval. We're about to have an election. We're having local elections primaries now. And Lord, there's so much junk going on. There's riots in Aurora yesterday and last night. Our world is filled with chaos and confusion. Don't tell me everything's fine and peaceful. Nobody's saying peace and safety right now. This is a time for us not to be praying little lay me down to sleep prayers this is a time for us to say god you're not speaking to me without ears to hear i am listening and here's what god is saying listen to this he said i heard their cry because of their taskmasters i know their sorrows would you just lift a hand and say god thank you for being aware he knows there's one reason why you're here today is that god knows So I've come down to deliver them. He's telling Moses, he's telling Moses, Moses, this is it. This is the plan. I've come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. I've come to get them out. Everybody say he came to get them out. But did he, did he came, come to get them out, to leave them out? No. He came, he said, down to deliver. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up. God's always an upgrade God. If you ever let God really have control, it'll always be an upgrade. He said, I'm going to bring them up. I'm going to bring them up, and I'm going to bring them out into a land good and large. A land with no more taskmasters, no more bricks to be to be, to be refined and no more building of storage cities for Egypt. No, no, no. All that will be behind them. I'm going to bring them out to a land flowing with milk and honey. For those of you who are sitting there saying milk and honey, you're like, I don't really know if I need any milk and honey. I, got, I don't really like milk and honey. Well, let me tell you. Translated, that is T-bone steak, grilled to perfection, or a nice savory smoked ham, and mashed potatoes. It's something good. It's something that is delicious. It made the children of Israel excited. It gave them hope. It was a vision. I have a better place for you. For you and for me, it doesn't have anything to do with food. It has everything to do with having a place where God is literally the God who is in our lives, changing everything, working miracles, satisfying the problems we have, giving us wisdom, giving us words to speak, and helping us through the challenges of our lives. That's what God says. I can bring you to such a place. He said, now therefore behold the cry, verse number nine, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression by which they're oppressed. And he tells Moses, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Because this crisis is turning into a new cycle of achievement for my people. That you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Musicians, join us as we get ready to pray. People change, folks, when the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of changing. That's it. People change when the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of changing. You know who knew that before any of us? Almighty God knew that. He knew that if his people were living in comfortable, climate-controlled condos in Egypt with a backyard pool and they could just get on the computer in the morning and work all day from a computer and air conditioning and go take drinks and breaks and walks and go work out and, and have a nice life he knew they would never come out ain't no way God said you know what I gotta do I gotta light a piece of a stick of dynamite and put it under them to make them want to leave this comfortable condo cause there's no way you and I would have wanted to leave and that's the problem with our world today. Our world, and I don't want it to be me because it's possible for some of us to have that filtered into our souls that everything is really okay. Don't mess with me. I'm all right. Don't talk to me. I'm good. Don't put no guilt on me. Don't put any, any, any compunction on me, whatever that is. Don't make me feel bad. I'm good. 
But God said, I want to show my people they're not good if they don't have me. If they don't have me in the middle, then they are really a miserable people. They are really in, in, in trouble. They're in crisis. Life is over. They're done. They're sick and tired of it. And you know what God said? There is a triggering event that is going to happen that is going to bring Moses' mission to fruition. And it's only when that triggering event happens, when, when that trigger is pulled, then I will begin my work. And that trigger, brothers and sisters, is a cry. How did a new cycle of achievement begin? A cry. What indicates to God that his people are ready for a change? A cry. How many of us are ready to say, God, change my home, change my business, change my life. Help me, God. I'm really sick of the way it is right now. Some of us aren't even in that place, but maybe there's enough here right now to say, God, I'm at the end. I'm at the, t t the middle of my crisis. I've got an event right now that's challenging me to the very core. I do not want, know what's going on, but Lord, I've come to church today out of faithfulness to you, Lord, and I might have a smile on my face and look like everything's okay, but truly, things are not okay. This message is for you. God, I gotta have some help. Can I tell you, it's okay to limber up your voice a little bit and figure out what it sounds like to hear yourself let out Without a cry unto God. Without a cry, there is not going to be any exodus. Without a cry, there will not be any achievement. Without a cry, there will not be help from God. I want to tell you something. God said, when there is a cry, then that's when I will get involved. So I'd like tonight, today, I'd like to give everybody an opportunity in your own seat. And we're well distanced. You don't have to worry about what anybody else thinks. I want to give you a chance to cry out to God. And if anybody here today is desperate enough, you're welcome to come up to the front and cry to God. Five times in the book of Acts, which is the history book of our church, the church of the apostolic Pentecostal faith, we're told the disciples five times they were in one accord. And it's also true in their crying out to the Lord that they raised their voice to God with one accord time to cry. That's this message. Time to cry. The end is the beginning. There's something better. Come on. Get a little hope in your heart right now. There's something better. Can I tell you the Old Testament, the time of great need for God's people, the Lord gave these instructions to the prophet Joel. He said, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants out of the land of the house of God and cry. They were gathered in God's house and gave voice to their united prayer. Then Joel himself set the example in verse 19. He said, O oh Lord, to you I cry out. So get ready. When an entire group cries out, hallelujah, I feel this so deeply in my spirit, church. Some of us need to say, God, you've given us a perspective of the history. You've given us an idea of where we are. We're not entering into this next adventure. We're not entering into this life as it's coming our way, completely oblivious, but we have a vision now. God, take us to a cycle, a brand new cycle, based on this simple concept from Exodus. A cry is the key. Folks, if you're sick and tired, friends and family, if you are just done with being a slave, to the world and worldly mindsets and worldly attitudes there's a choice today that you make and that is to sit there quietly or you can cry amen you, you can do that there's a choice you can make Egypt is always and has always been a representation of a life that is godless a society that denies God Egypt is a culture that opposes God can I tell you the Pharaoh of ancient Egypt is a picture of the devil himself. Pharaoh was the prince of Egypt just like Satan's the prince of this world. Pharaoh oppressed people. Satan also oppresses people. Pharaoh held the people of Egypt under his rule. So does Satan hold the people of the world under his rule. Pharaoh enslaved people to do his will. Satan enslaves people to do his will. That is to sin. But you and I are in a place with the answer. We have the key to come out of this bondage. We don't have to live in this anymore. We don't have to be 
at the will of the devil anymore. Are you in Egypt? You can come out today. You can come out with your hand high. You can come out on eagle's wings. You can come out and God carrying you to the next adventure, to a better place and a better way. It begins for you the very same as it began for Egypt. It begins with a cry. Make today an ending and a beginning. I'm gonna invite you to turn and pray at your seats or stand up and pray or come to the altar. But at this time, would you all join me in church time? Altar prayer from wherever you are. Come on. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. Your cry marks the best ending and the best beginning for the rest of your life. I want to invite you, church. I want to invite you, friends. Don't be afraid to make some noise. The ones who are going to get God's exodus power are those who are going to be willing to make a noise. Go ahead. Don't be ashamed to cry out to God. Let's make a little noise in this house. I invite you, family members, pray. Cry. Come on. Mothers, cry. Fathers, cry. Children, cry. Do we have any grandparents, any aunts and uncles? Cry. Do we have any employers, employees? It's time to cry. Do we have any in the need for the Lord help today? Cry. Come on. I'm going to invite you, church. It's not a time to be silent. It's a time to make some noise.